Make sure it's not just me who's seeing it weird. Okay. So now they should see the three of us. Oh yeah, I, I see us. You see us? Yeah, I just went to the Twitch stream. Oh, excellent. Which Twitch stream? <laughs> I hear myself now too. Okay, it's fantastic. We're a, we are a professional organization here on Friday night. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we're gonna call that one my fault. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> Welcome uh, to Q and A with Patrick Wardle. We are going to be talking about some macOS stuff and some stuff kind of adjacent to Microsoft Office. Um, I am Jurist, and the other goon that you see here is Fallible. And we're going to be helping ask Patrick some questions this evening. And it's good to see you all in the chat. Uh, Patrick, why don't you um, uh, take a minute to introduce yourself to everybody? Because uh, I knew that in your talk you, you kind of dove right in, uh, into, into your content. So take a minute, say hello to everybody, tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, aloha. My name is Patrick Wardle. I am a principal security researcher at Jamf. Um, and I'm also the creator of the Mac Security website and Tool Suite uh, Objective C. I have been uh, fortunate enough to talk at a few DEF CONs in the past. It's always one of my favorites. Uh, events to talk nerdy at. Um, this year, virtual, you know, full bomb. We didn't all get to hang out together in Vegas, but I think it's important that we're all staying safe and healthy. And uh, actually, connecting online is kind of super hackerish. So uh, I'm stoked you're all here to chat a little bit more about my talk, open Q&A. Again, welcome. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. And uh, it's nice to get to some folks who uh, want to come and present this way. So uh, SneakerNet gave us what uh, they're considering to be a softball question. Is SYLK the old file format you've come across? Is there a way to programmatically scan Mac OS uh, apps for what kind of files they handle, entitlements, particular API usage? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, the first place I would look at is in something called the Launch Services Database. Um, and you can enumerate this with the ls register command. And what it will basically do is it will dump um, all the file type and application associations on your Mac OS system. So for example, you can see what applications have registered for HTML files? Uh, what applications have registered to handle documents? Uh, in this case, what type of applications perhaps support these uh, SYLK files? Uh, so that's kind of where I would start. It gives you a global overview of that. So if you just Google ls register, again, it's a Mac OS command. You run it with the dash dump flag, and it'll dump this database. You can also look at an application's info.plist file, which is something that all applications have. And in there, they can have a set, uh, it's actually an array, a dictionary of key value pairs that kind of tell the operating system what type of applications, uh, sorry, what kind of files they support. And um, this is actually how that database gets populated. Um, so for example, Microsoft Office will list the doc files and file formats it supports. Obviously, a browser will have a large list, including HTML files, probably PDFs, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great place to start, because then you can see the file formats, and then I would look at the more esoteric or unrecognized ones and start fuzzing or playing with that. Because it's kind of mentioned in my talk, uh, the reason that this vulnerability existed, specifically the automatic execution of macros, was that Microsoft actually has two separate code paths for handling macros based on these file types. Uh, you know, obviously the main one for documents, um, and then a whole separate archaic code path that probably no one ever looked at for these older file formats. So always a good idea to look for these more esoteric ancient file formats because there's a lot of security bugs there because they were created in a time when security wasn't really a priority. Any time an afterthought gets pulled forward into what's happening now is probably an interesting space. Exactly. Cool. Next question coming in also from uh, SneakerNet. Uh, is there a way to programmatically scan Mac apps? Oh, we, we did that one already. Uh, let's see here. Have you considered trying to do something similar to this kind of research with iPad OS 
or any other kind of non uh, non Windows OS or mobile OS? Uh, that's a great question. I predominantly focus on Mac for two reasons. Uh, first. My personal opinion is really good to get really niche in whatever area that interests. That's just something that I found to kind of have a lot of success in my infosec security career. Um, <laughs> the other fact, and yes, I will admit this, is hacking Mac is far simpler than hacking an iOS uh, operating system or iPad OS. Um, and largely, this is just because of how locked down that operating system is. Uh, so. I think there has been some research done in the past based on you know, custom URL handling, which is largely how applications and certain file formats are kind of connected in a way um, on iOS. But you know, even if you found some interesting issues there, you would have to break out of the sandbox and then deal with a lot of the extra constraints that iOS and iPad OS kind of stack on top. That with Mac OS, and then you really don't have to worry about too much. I mean, you did have to find a new sandbox escape, but you showed that was pretty trivial to do, and there's been kind of history of that. Um, so, you know, the TLDR, iOS is just really a hard target. Um, so I'll probably just stick to Max for now. <laughs> so that's an interesting statement, though, that uh, you found that getting really niche is the thing that helps you continue to find new interesting uh, vulnerabilities, so you're, you're keeping your target list really small. Can you talk about that any more? And uh, some of the, what are some of the strengths that that's bringing you? And can you think of anything that you're missing that uh, that maybe, if there was one more thing you wanted to add? Yeah, no, and that's something that you know, as I grow older and wiser, it's something that resonates really well with me. So. You know, a long time ago, I used, uh, used to work at the, the NSA, National Security Agency, everyone's favorite you know, US government spy agency. And I remember when I got there, I was an intern, and uh, the intern program, you kind of bounce around from different office, kind of sampling different uh, activities, let's say. And I remember thinking, wow, I want to be good at all of this, like crypto and like uh, reverse engineering malware, and writing Windows exploits, and hacking satellites, like all the really cool stuff the NSA does. And I got to a point where I was like, you know, it's just impossible to have depth in so much breadth. Um, and so I said, look, I'm going to kind of focus on one specific thing. Um, and actually, it was only when I left the NSA was when I really started focusing on Max. The reason for that was uh, at the NSA, I did predominantly Windows stuff. Um, and so when I left, I wanted to still use my foundational skills of reverse engineering, vulnerability discovery, exploit development, but I didn't want to do it on the same platform. I was kind of poking around at the NSA. Just it's good not to cross any lines, and you know you don't want to piss off the NSA. So I said, hey, look, let me focus on Mac. Um, I can use my same skill sets, but it's a separate platform, so I probably won't step on any of these codes. And um, moving forward with that, I really kind of doubled down on that. And it really allowed me to get a lot of depth in the topic. And I've noticed for you know, finding new vulnerabilities, um, giving conference talks, right? at least for me, having that depth has really allowed me to become you know, somewhat of an expert in the space, I would say, um, and allowed me to really dig more into maybe the more esoteric parts of the operating system where a lot of vulnerabilities lie. Whereas if I was trying to do that across maybe multiple operating systems and multiple platforms, um, it's just, I think, impossible to gain that much depth. Um, so that's something that's just really worked for me. I would say the one downside is sometimes you might miss attacks that work on one platform that might have a conceptually similar vulnerability on Mac OS. One great example I can think of is DLL or dialect hijacking. That was a very common uh, kind of attack scenario on Windows and I, you know, when I was still kind of coming into the Mac space, I decided to see if Mac OS was vulnerable, at least conceptually, to the idea of hijacking uh, dynamic libraries based on search path. And it turned out it was, and I just happened to be the first person that kind of dug into that and talked about it. Um, so I still think it's good to keep your eyes and ears open and see what other research other people are doing, um, just to be inspired and then kind of say, hey, is this something I can bring into my platform? Um, but again, I've had a lot of success really focusing just on one platform, um, you know, Mac OS, not even iOS as much. Uh, so again, to me, that's worked really well, and I think it's, it's a good nugget of advice. Yeah, thank you for talking about that a bit, because uh, it's nice to hear somebody who's gotten a lot of success with a pattern like that, because there's, there's many different patterns that I've been hearing about even this weekend, so it's, it's nice to 
nice to get that reinforcement. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that because I do a lot of digital forensics, right? And you know, so I see a lot of Windows stuff come across, and I see a lot of iOS stuff, and it's uh, it's kind of difficult to know. Hey, you know, if I'm going to if I'm going to dedicate some time to build up some skills, you know, should it be broad based, should it be targeted, and, and I'm I'm I'm, yeah. I'm digging what you what you're throwing down there. Um, next question. Okay, so you showed um, how putting a zip file into the login items. Um, the intern, uh, the intern contains a plist with a launch agent, right? So does Mac OS yeah. really register launch agents on the creation of the file? In this, in this case, uh, creating it via an unzip. Uh, almost. So it actually, what it does is it automatically processes it on the next login. So it doesn't trigger it right away on creation, uh, but on the next login, Mac OS will automatically just enumerate all the property lists that are created in the launch agent directory. It does the same thing with launch daemons. And any property list it finds, it just runs it. Uh, so that's really kind of a neat thing that we were able to leverage as a mechanism to get this kind of code execution outside uh, the sandbox. The only downside is you then have to kind of wait until the user relogs in. But you know, I like to say, you know, humans are impatient, but our exploits, our malware, you know, don't, don't have to be, right? We drop this launch agent and we have to wait two or three days or even a week until the user relogs in and then we get a call back, like so be it, right? Generally we're not in, in that much of a, a rush. But it is interesting that Mac OS kind of automatically runs those and something that we can in this scenario leverage to our own benefit. Sure. Uh, follow up from the same person that asked the question. It, any P list it can find on the file system? No, it actually has to be in the launch agent directory, which is either in uh, tilde user uh, slash library launch agent or slash library slash launch agents. Um, so Mac OS will look in those specific directories. Uh, it looks for other um, items in other directories. For example, there are other launch daemon directories, which it looks for for other property lists. But again, those have to be in those specific directories. Cool. So, you know, a lot of this starts by you talking about macro attacks. And macro attacks have been popular on Windows for a long time. In fact, using macros inside of Office documents I mean, you and I are roughly the same age. That's that, that's how you would get out of like the the net nanny kind of stuff, or get get, get away the get, get around the stuff that, that, that they put on uh, stuff at uh, high school or middle school, so that you couldn't get on the Maybe. internet, right? You know, yeah. Statute of limitations is good. We're well, it's it's fine now. Um, so it, and it, it is bananas to me that the, the, this still stuff kind of persists now. Do you? Um, do you think that this is kind of a trend towards macro-based attacks towards Mac OS, or is this just kind of a situation where, you know, the guys that are, are you know, if you've got a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail kind of a situation? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think, well, we see two things happening. Uh, Macs are definitely becoming more prevalent, um, you know, we've seen this. Uh, especially in the consumer space, but now also in the enterprise space. And I think that's one of the reasons this is very anecdotal. I don't have necessarily data to back this up. But you know, you go to a college campus even three or four or five years ago, everyone has Macs, right? And now those students have graduated or entered the workforce, what do they want? They want Mac computers, understandably so, right? So we're kind of starting to see growth in the enterprise of Macs as well. Apple obviously also pushes for Macs uh, in the enterprise, you know, they're great hardware, great software. Um, so hacker, hackers are obviously very opportunistic. So as they see an increase in targets, they're obviously going to start attacking them. So one of the things we see is we see hackers developing Mac-specific attacks. And we've seen this trend, I would say, in the last year or two almost taking off. At the same time, in parallel, the other thing we see, uh, and the Mac OS is a great example, is we see uh, Windows-based attackers or Windows-based malware that have had success on the Windows platform kind of porting those techniques over. Um, so obviously, as you mentioned, Macros on Windows has a very illustrious history, uh, a lot of success. So those same attacks you know, can work on Mac OS. So hackers are kind of like, hey, we, we know how these macro work. We have the infrastructure. We have experience. Why not target Mac users? So, macros is probably the best example of uh, traditionally Windows 
infection vector, let's say, being ported over or brought over to macOS. Uh, I think in a direct response to Macs increasing in the enterprise. Because these macro-based attacks still require Microsoft products, and the average consumer is probably going to be using Apple's Office document uh, apps, which aren't susceptible to these macro-based attacks. Whereas in the enterprise, I think that's where we see the uptick in the installation of these uh, Microsoft products on Macs, thereby opening the door for these macro-based attacks. However, though, we also see, for example, uh, adware, um, you know, that's been predominantly targeting Windows, you know, via uh, Chrome on Windows or Edge or Internet Explorer. Same kind of idea, right? Hackers, malware writers have success on that and say, hey, we can port these to Mac pretty easily. You know, it's kind of cross-platform, um, these techniques and these malicious extensions we create. So, you know, why don't we start targeting Mac users because they're growing in numbers. Uh, so we're definitely seeing more and more of these window, these kind of like old school or very well-known Windows-based infection vectors and attacks now kind of showing up targeting Macs specifically. And it, it's interesting because I think Mac users maybe are at more risk because, you know, it's like what Mac user thinks that they can get a macro virus on their Mac, like zero, right? Uh, traditionally, Apple's marketing has kind of put out the message that Macs are immune, uh, and so a lot of Mac users uh, believe that. So, whereas someone on a Windows computer might not open a Word document from a random email, a Mac user might. So, hackers may be having better success rate, actually, by targeting Mac users, um, you know, using these kind of well-known techniques that might not fly on Windows anymore. Right, or for that matter, not know that, that Office on the Mac can support some of that stuff that would be also running over on the Windows side, right? You know, well, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a VPK macro to just go ahead and run okay. That's crazy town. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, there was a little bit of a follow-up from uh, JKBCKR uh, who asked the P-List question. Um, I'll just pop this out here. Oh, I got it. The zip was placed into the library and extracted a folder called Launch Agents with the plist inside, which is the current or the correct location for Launch Agents. Um, but, okay, so a quick follow up, if that's okay. Does this only work if there was a no Launch Agents initially? Otherwise, Archive Utility would rename that Launch Agents two, right? Yes, and that's actually a really good point. So the reason this generally works is because on a default install of macOS, there is no launch agent directory under the user's directory. Um, so there is one in the slash library directory. We couldn't write to that location from the sandbox. So what we could do, though, is we could write to the user's library directory, right, till the slash library, put a specially crafted, crafted zip file there, and then the archive utility would create the launch agent directory for us, because again, we could also not create or write a plist to that directory because Microsoft's patch specifically forbade that. So yes, if that launch agent directory is already there, this specific attack venue would fail. What we could possibly do though is create files in other locations and perhaps create a you know dot bash rc file or some other file that leads to code execution. Um, someone also mentioned perhaps you could do something with symlinks. Uh, so maybe symlink the, you know, put a, make a zip file with symlinks. I haven't really dug into that. Um, but I think the fact that we can, outside the sandbox, create kind of arbitrary files. Um, the launch agent path was really just the first one I tried that worked. But there might be other venues that are more globally applicable that, for example, for example wouldn't fail if the launch agent directory was so that's a really good question and, a, and, a, and an excellent point to be made. Excellent, okay. Um, we'll step back for a second to uh, SneakerNet has another question. Are there any Apple-specific protocols you found really interesting? Protocols can be either uh, in a process on the same system or between devices. This is uh, example sidecar between laptop and iPad. Yeah, so there are actually, the, the IPC mechanisms in Mac OS are are full of security vulnerabilities, or have been in the past. Um, so one great example is just the handling of these custom URL schemes. So it turns out that if an application supports a file format um, or supports a custom URL scheme, custom URL scheme can be like blah colon slash slash anything, 
Um, you know, HTTP would be one example, but applications can also create their own custom URL handlers as a kind of lightweight IPC mechanism. Um, and this is used legitimately. If an application contains a custom URL handler, as soon as it hits the file system, Mac OS actually parses that application and registers it as a custom URL handler. A URL can then be launched from the browser. Uh, luckily, recent versions of browsers now will alert the user, basically saying, hey, a web page is trying to make a custom URL, custom URL request. But in the past, that was not the case. Uh, and we actually saw the Windtail APT group abuse this technique to target Mac users specifically. So their exploit, you browse to a website. In the background, it would download an application that handled a custom URL scheme. Mac OS would automatically register that behind the scenes as soon as that application hit the file system. Their exploit code would then just make a URL request from the malicious website, which is totally legitimate, something you can do. Mac OS would look and say, hey, yeah, I have an application that can handle that, and would then blindly and naively launch the malware, which had just been downloaded because it had this custom URL. So these custom URL schemes are kind of a Mac-specific protocol or an IPC mechanism where there are some interesting uh, issues, especially uh, in the past. I think my other favorite protocol or IPC mechanism is XPC. Ian Beer at Google has done some great work finding all sorts of vulnerabilities. Some other Google Project Zero, uh, such as Brandon, researchers have found bugs as well. Uh, and basically, XPC is just a way where a client can talk to a usually a privileged server. Um, and so it's really good to kind of enumerate the API endpoints that the server has and the biggest issue is usually it doesn't correctly validate the client, which means once you're on the system, you perhaps can talk to a trusted service and do all sorts of nasty things. This is often you know, application specific based on the XPC server, but Apple has had all sorts of issues here. So for example, the uh, well-known root pipe vulnerability uh, was a great example. There was a XPC service running on Mac OS as root uh, and it would think uh, create random arbitrary files and run arbitrary commands as root, and it didn't validate the client. So as soon as you were on the box, you could just send this XPC protocol request to this XPC service that was running, and it'd be like, yeah, I'll run whatever you say. And so it was like the easiest, best privilege escalation vulnerability is there. So XPC, great protocol, Apple specific. Um, I always look at what kind of servers and applications, if they have an XPC interface, and start auditing those because oftentimes there's security issues there. That's your big blinking red light, huh? Yeah, like poke on that hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have found ourselves in our last five minutes on this. If uh, if we have any more really good questions you want to drop in here, then please do. In the meantime, uh, this is when I've taken to uh, asking people if they have a general call to action, a something you would like us to take away from the presentation that you've done, something that you'd like us all to consider and move forward with. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, this is probably obvious to anyone listening here, but a lot of Mac users think that Macs are infallible. Um, and, and this actually puts themselves at, at risk because, you know, a lot of Windows users will maybe um, participate in best cyber safe practices, whatever that means, you know, don't download random apps, click random links and emails, run random applications. Whereas on macOS, people are prone to do that a little more. So, you know, just realizing Macs are just as hackable as Windows, it's an operating system that runs code, so uh, kind of, uh, just kind of stick with that. Uh, the other thing, and this is kind of a, a self plug, but it's for free content, so I don't feel bad. Uh, in my presentation, I announced uh, the free uh, Mac OS book series I'm working on. So if you go to taomm.org, the art of Mac malware.org, um, I'm working on a uh, free book about uh, Mac malware analysis. So it talks a lot about infection vectors, these property lists, this XPC stuff. So if you're interested in you know, Mac malware, vulnerability research, uh, check it out. It's all free. The content, I've published the uh, first part of the first volume. It's actually commentable on. Um, so, you know, if you see an error or you want some input, you can just add a little comment and I will add that into uh, the content. Um, and again, it's a free resource, just basically trying to help provide more information for the community so that we can combat 
uh, kind of the rising tide of Mac malware that's, that's, that's definitely coming. Well, that's something I can look forward to as well. So thank you. If you would be so kind as to uh, drop the URL for that in the track one, and if you are willing to do so with any other contact information for you or a Twitter profile or something you want people to follow, that'd be a good place for that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put my Twitter, my DMs are open. Obviously, I'm very passionate about this. I love to nerd out, talk about this. So uh, any questions, shoot me a DM and we'll, we'll chat. So. Excellent. Thank you. That's uh, We've gotten to the end of the uh, questions in the live Q&A chat. Um, I think that you've been a fantastic guest here, and we really appreciate your uh, willingness to come and build a presentation and, and then spend some time with us in the QA. So Yeah, thank you. Like I said, it's always an honor to talk at DEF CON. I just feel super appreciative to be able to share my research with just the DEF CON community. I mean, they're just you know, the best. Well, we're the best because of the people who decide to come out and do this stuff. So thank you all. Win win. <laughs> it seems like that's about all we have. So um, anybody who wants to do any follow up on this one, you will have some contact information showing up. And uh, thank you all for showing up. And we'll we'll do more later. Cool. See you guys later. Thanks for coming. Love. Her.